Let us now pause to pose the question, what is a soul? We, as the majority of the population of modern humans, collectively assert the existence of, and that each living body is possessed of, such a thing as a soul. Why? There are two reasons. One reason is our direct experience of such while alive as biological bodies. By illness and fever, or by induction of similar symptoms by use of psychoactive chemicals in our natural environment, we have direct experience of many otherwise invisible insights into the nature of our reality. By studying these, we can assemble a general assertion of them as separate from, although overlapping in the realm of potential co-causality, the realms of visible and of more or less solid material in physical reality. This second nature we can call the domain of the purely biologically mental, or the so-called psychic, and its occasional, however rare, overlaps into the realm of causality over physical material reality, we can assess as the domain of the paranormal branch of the modern physical sciences. Another reason is our ability to cross-reference records of such experiences preserved from throughout our entire species history and comprising our entire collective corpus of knowledge on the subject of the nature of the concept of the soul. When combined with the direct experience of the invisible landscape induced during fever or by a near-death experience, the study of these records is claimed to assist us in preparing for the moment of our own final death, when our biological body dies, so that, in theory, our mind may persist and be preserved in this psychic, ethereal realm in the form of a soul. According to the majority of the sources, both the most ancient and the modern, that have studied this subject, the soul is attached to a biological body while the physical being remains alive in the form of its electromagnetic charge. In our own upright walking species, we have evolved electromagnetic dual polarity between the top of our skull, or dorsally, the front of any other type of skeletal body, and the opposite end of our spinal column, basally, as a vestigial tailbone. In our species, there are seven primary neural clusters along this central nervous system, from which branch 12 secondary nervous fibers that extend to comprise our entire peripheral nervous system. These 12 peripheral fibers, called meridians, and the seven central ganglia and plexi, called chakras, combine with the overall field of their collective electrical charge to comprise the living soul, or psyche, while the human body is alive. The psyche, or what Freud called ego, works by a process of electrochemical, what Freud called phi, or what are commonly now called neurotransmitters, stimulus, building up and firing off at relatively random intervals, a process Freud called hypercathexis, causing the otherwise autonomic-only nervous functioning to achieve a condition of extra energy, equivalent to inspiration or the activity of thoughts. In the sense this collective psychological construct of a soul is said to exist, attached to the living biological body while the biological body is alive, it is also believed to be able to become detached from an original host itself and survive on its own. Assigning the moral binary dualism of good and evil to the dipolar electromagnetic reactive invisible and for the most part intangible ether energy we find there to be both good and evil units of invisible moral karma comprising a fifth elemental universal field of force, 
just as there are positive and negative polarity to dipolar magnets. Further applying this moral binary dualism to the concept of the soul as an archetypal template for the electromagnetic aura, we find it is usually considered good for the soul to live on after the death of the biological body through privation, illness, injury, or old age. Likewise, we find it more often considered evil for the soul to leave the biological body prior to the death of the biological body, as in the so-called pacts with devils involving the concept of selling one's soul. Furthermore, the concept of the transmigration of the soul after death, or after being separated from a biological body prior to its death, has produced the significant moral passion plays of the various religious myths throughout all our human ages. As we shall see in the main text of this exposition, this basic belief in the concept of a soul has been shaped and changed by the evolution of our species as a social animal. In the most ancient writings that study the nature of the concept of the soul or aura of living biological beings' bodies, we find only references to even more ancient beliefs about these concepts already ingrained in the minds of the author's intended audiences of their day. For example, the great scribes of the golden era of philosophy in Athens, Greece, and the surrounding polities of the Attica Peninsula around 500 to 300 BC Gregorian, such as Plato and his student Aristotle, frequently make primary reference to prior public opinion in their appeals to the audience for a sense of authority on their intended subjects. Even earlier than these first philosophers, the sages of earliest civilizations, the exile ascetics of the earliest caste system based city-states formulated their own metaphysics on the nature of the soul. Many of the prior popular public opinions on the subject referred to by the Greek philosophers were originally formulated in their most complex details in myths written by these Asian, Aryan, Indo-European sages of the further Eastern Orient. These myths, such as the Rig Veda and the Mahabharata, Describe events even earlier than these first civilizations themselves, involving even earlier students of this same topic. However, from before the era of the sages, no extant written records are publicly now known to either have existed, nor to have been preserved until today. However, as we shall now examine, there is archaeological evidence from the era prior to the beginning of the written historical records kept by our species. Much of this indicates that even our earliest ancestors as a species, long prior to the beginning of keeping historical events in a written record, when we still lived as primitive, semi-nomadic cave dwellers, had already established in their tribal societies a complex metaphysical belief system regarding the nature of the soul. The true nature of the soul is a subject that has been studied by our species since its origin as an evolutionary offshoot of the proto-hominid species called Australopithecus, which were themselves an offshoot of the even earlier species called Ardipithecus. The Ardipithecus, Latin meaning worker, were little different in their physiology from modern families of the ape genus of our own hominid lineage. The baboon, or calf ape, of Africa is a descendant of the Ardipithecus ramata offshoot of the Ardipithecus protohominids, and we are descended from the other lineage of Ardipithecus, called Ardipithecus A, or Alpha. The Ardipithecus protohominids generated the Australopithecus, from whom we and our cousin species of hominids, the Neanderthals, were sired, as well as the cousin species of the Australopithecus species, called the Cro-Magnons. The earliest examples of our own species genome sequence can be traced back to the central sub-Saharan desert south of the equator region of Africa, with so-called mitochondrial Eve. 
It is known that our species, while in our earliest developmental era as semi-nomadic tribal cave dwellers, cohabited with our cousin species, the Neanderthals. However, because the fossil record indicates our earliest ancestors were originally following a northward migration route across Africa into the area of the Levant where, as cave dwellers, they cohabited with Neanderthals. We cannot be certain how far back in the protohominid species the practices we are about to discuss might date even prior to our own use of them as human beings, because the south polar continent of Antarctica, where our protohominid ancestor species may have originated, remains now, unlike then, glaciated in a massive ice sheet. From some 600,000 years ago, until as recently as 32,000 years ago, there were twin species of hominid competing and coexisting on the surface of the earth in the regions populated by our earliest human ancestors. One of them was, of course, our own species, the human genus of Homo sapien, and the other, our genetic cousin species, was the species we call today the Neanderthal species. The Neanderthal species eventually became extinct and modern Homo sapien scientists remain in debate over the fossil records as to exactly why. Although it is widely held among archaeological and anthropological scholars who study this era of our species' evolution, that the Neanderthal species and our own Homo sapien species both evolved from the same earlier proto-hominid species Australopithecus, there is not yet consensus on the exact amount of genetic material contributed to these twin subsets of the Australopithecus species from the cousin species of Australopithecus, the Cro-Magnon. The Cro-Magnon became prevalent first in the Levant region before 37,500 years ago, later spreading northward and westward across Europe until around 30,000 years ago. Whereas the Australopithecus species originated in eastern Africa, to the south of the Levant, between four and two million years ago. Thus, the northern migrating Australopithecus species is credited with siring the northern migrating Cro-Magnon and semi-sedentary Neanderthal species, which themselves may have interbred to become our modern species of Homo sapien human beings. The archaeological study of these ancient pre-human species forms of culture and their belief systems is called today anthropology and paleontology. We study them for the purpose of learning what influence their beliefs had on the earliest ancestors of our own species. However, the fact that many of our own species' beliefs, particularly about the nature of the soul, are borrowed from our own species' ancestors, should not be overlooked as bearing such ample evidence from this field of study. The Neanderthal species are well known for seemingly having originated the practice of burial of their species dead. Evidence beginning to be adopted and becoming more widely accepted in modern times, the 21st century A.D. Gregorian, indicates this could have been due to an outbreak of cannibalism known to have occurred among the species in Abri Mola, modern France, where they had a highly evolved culture that involved the grinding up of natural pigments such as manganese and red ochre for use in both body and cave mural paintings. The European Neanderthals were nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes, and the possibility of ritualistic cannibalism by one tribe in France should not be thought of as being ruled out as having causally influenced the practice of ritual burials that occurred in the Shanidar Caves of the Zagros mountain range in the modern Kurdistan region of Iraq from 80 to 60,000 years ago. The most notable burial of remains found at the Shanidar Caves site is called the Flower Burial for having included so many pollinating seeds found beside the body which was seemingly arranged in fetal position. Because there are conflicting theories proposing more widespread cannibalism among the European Neanderthals, 
as well as the possibility that the apparently ritual burials at Shanadar Cave might only be victims of a caving. It remains difficult for modern anthropologists and paleontologists to come to consensus on the actual cultural significance to the Neanderthal species of the concept of the biological body's death. However, the evidence of their practice of building large dwelling huts from the bones of slain mammoth, bison, and auric bones, and their tanned animal hides during periods of nomadic hunts following these migrating animal herds, does appear to have led to their initiation of the inclusion of grave goods along with the interred corpses of their species, and this indicates that, at least as early as the time of the Neanderthal species, there was already beginning to be formulated in our proto-hominid ancestor species relatively primitive minds some concept related to the nature of the soul in an afterlife. It is known now that the earliest true members of our genetic species, Homo sapiens, cohabited with Neanderthal species in areas such as the Kebaran Caves in modern Israel around some 70,000 years ago, and that more than merely exchanging cultural tendencies through development of the original use of language, the Neanderthal species ultimately contributed as much as 4% of the modern human genome through interspecies breeding. The original use of stone-carved arrow and spearheads appears to have emanated from this cross-acculturation between these early twin cousin species by some 50,000 years ago. However, more significantly, our species appears to have inherited the practice of ritual burial of our dead. Although there were various other sub- and semi-species of hominids in various other locations on the planet by around 11,500 years ago, when, for example, the Red Deer Cave people of modern China thrived, the origins of the Homo sapiens species in and its migration from Africa is not denied as having occurred first around 500,000 years ago. Modern anthropologists agree our earliest ancestors interbred with the Neanderthal species as well as another proto-hominid species, the Denisovans, of northern Asia and that this species contributed as much as 6% of the modern genome to a segment of the modern populations of Homo sapiens comprising only 2.3% of the modern population of the island continent of Australia today, the indigenous so-called aboriginals. Around 12,000 to 10,000 years ago, our species underwent the first in a series of so-called cultural revolutions in a pattern of what is called today punctuated equilibrium. This initial Neolithic or agrarian cultural revolution began when modernly evolved Homo sapiens had migrated to inhabit the entirety of the unfrozen continental land masses of the entire planet Earth. As the final inland migrations into southernmost South America, some 9,000 to 7,000 years ago, were occurring in the Levant, from 9,000 to 7,000 BC, and Oceania's Melanesia chain of islands, beginning some 8,000 BCE, followed by cultivation in sub-Saharan Africa by 2,500 BC. The earliest domestication of plants and animals, the cultivation of grains for cereals, and the use of controlled breeding practices, animal husbandry, to produce tame herd animals to till the soil for the sowing of large fields of these crops began. This led to the cultivation of settlements around these agrarian developments and the origins of our species' pursuit of civilization. As our species began to develop inwardly in fixed locations, rather than progressively following migrating herds of untamed animals, we began to develop our own extremely complex metaphysics describing the nature of the soul. In all the earliest written records of history preserved from the era of these original civilizations, there is mention of the nature of an invisible, 
supernatural realm of the mind where paranormal phenomenon is the norm, not the exception. The ancients called this invisible landscape the underworld. Civilizations of various small city-states, that is, a small fortified town of a population as large as five to ten thousand or so people, surrounded by agricultural fields, began to become interconnected to form the earliest proto-empires in three continental locations semi-simultaneously, all of them in the fertile basins of river valleys. In Africa, in the Nile River Valley, the Nubian civilization of Ethiopia began to form the Egyptian civilization. In the Levant, in the Tigris and Euphrates Rivers Valley, modern Iraq and Saudi Arabia, the Sumero-Akkadian alliance formed, and in the Ganges and Indus River Valleys of the Indian subcontinent of Southern Asia, the Vedic Hindu culture arose. In each of these was formed a class system hierarchy to rank and file the economic value to their whole society of each individual citizen. The caste system of all three was essentially the same, forming a population pyramid with the majority of the population being unpaid slave laborers and the minority being the city-state's official ruling magistrates or so-called priest kings. In the Indus River Valley region of the Asian subcontinent of India, the earliest and some would posit most complex metaphysical myths originated some 10,000 years ago. These include the Rig Veda mythic records, among other Vedic dogmas, as well as the epic Sanskrit poem the Mahabharata. A later addition to these earliest historical mythic cycles was the Sri Upanishad, as the Vedic culture began to transition into the more modernly prevalent Hindu religion. In the Rig Veda, the Mahabharata, the Upanishads and the writings of all the countless sages of the region and the surrounding areas since then, there has been a preponderance of consideration given to the topic of the nature of the soul. Creating a rigid caste system, where the untouchables formed a massive slave caste, where various merchants, artisans, and trades workers formed a burgeoning middle class of increasingly wealthy landowners. The Vedic scriptures additionally outlined strict guidelines for the practice of religion by an autonomous caste of priests, including dirges to be performed as mass songs, proper methods for prayer and sacrifice to the various different pantheon of ruling natural forces, the so-called gods, dress and dietary codes, methods of rendering natural medical treatments, etc. Combining the priest caste as a cultural motivator and the competition between the various artisans and craftsmen of the middle or merchant class, the Indus River culture thrived under the Vedic caste system to become a massive empire. However, just as there was a very high degree of cultural civilization in the urban areas of this era, there remained exiles and outcasts from these centers of technological development who were, nevertheless, included as cultural contributors in the making of the ancient myths. These were the so-called sages, commonly referred to today in the region as gurus of the Sikh religion. As the populations increased in the urban areas, they began to expand both their district and broader geographical borders to include more and more of the outlying areas of land. Population centers grew rapidly and population density reached a plateau or critical mass at which point the Vedic Empire began to stagnate until it eventually fragmented into the modern religious sects of the region today. The rules for the government of the city-states became secondary to the rules for the practice of religious rituals, 
and the people became widely homogenized in their beliefs, while remaining individually disparate in their practical applications of skills. At this point, the religious ritual practitioners included almost all members of the society in some manner, and belief in the pantheon of the Hindu religion reached its zenith. On the outskirts of this predominantly Hindu society remained practitioners of older, ritualistic religious beliefs, such as the Bon shamans of Tibet, modern China, and many other independent sects which paralleled mainstream religious beliefs emanated from these various sages and shamans. By around the same era as the aforementioned Greek Golden Age of Athenian democracy, in the Far Eastern Orient, there began to arise a class of religious scribes devoted primarily to recording their studies on the nature of the soul. Chief among these was purportedly one Prince Siddhartha, called Gautama Buddha, whose school of beliefs quickly spread throughout the region. While the Hindu religion, based on the prior Vedic scriptures, outlined a complex pantheon of literally hundreds of deities, each representing one or a particular combination of multiple natural forces, Buddha simplified this belief system into two basic components, a simple ethical or moral message regarding the right manner of practicing meditative techniques to prepare one's soul for the moment of the body's physical biological death, and a complex metaphysical ontological cosmology describing the realms of the afterlife or underworld experienced by the soul as the body dies. The former we know of as the basis also for the modern Hindu sub-religion of Krishnaism, and the latter we may recognize as having been adopted by Buddha from the Bone Book of the Dead, as the Tibetan Buddhist practice of the ritual burial method called the Sky Ceremony, in which a corpse is dismembered and fed to vultures or wild animals, and which may be an imitation of the true cause for the apparently cannibalistic or ritual defleshing practices among the ancient Neanderthal species as well. Hence, much of what has since come to be associated in post-Vedic era Hinduism with Buddhist doctrines on the reincarnation of the soul may indeed have originated from this ancient human imitation of the Neanderthal proto-hominid species through the Bon Shaman of Tibet. We shall return to discuss the substance of these beliefs on the reincarnation of the soul in a subsequent section. Contemporary to the rise of the Vedic Empire, although only connected to it by the much-fabled Silk Road through the Khyber Pass of modern Pakistan, arose the equally complex social hierarchy and cultural beliefs of the Levant region and eastern Africa. The cross-cultural exchanges between the Sumero-Akkadian Empire of the Ubayid period in modern Iraq and the Old and Middle Kingdoms of the Kemta Empire of Egypt caused the development of an extremely intricate metaphysical cosmology that was equally intricately interwoven into their pantheon of gods conceived of as singular or combined natural forces. This entire vast ontological tapestry and mythic tableau eventually formulated its own self-destructive concept in the form of monotheism, an idea germinating from the Abrahamic concept of Ahura Mazda, a supposedly interplanetary visitor whom arrived in his Faravarhar, or Vimana, ship from the sky, a tradition still preserved by modern Zoroastrians of the Levant region today. During the period of time this cross-cultural exchange was occurring to form this intricate mythic metaphysical cosmology throughout the Levant region, empires arose and fell, megalithic monuments were erected, Languages proliferated and there was constant religious obsession over the nature of the soul and the concept of the afterlife or underworld. Ultimately, as has been restated, 
around the same time as the advent of Buddhism in the Orient, in the Greek Attica Peninsula of the Mediterranean region of the Levant, a philosophical golden age occurred, and the consideration of the subject of the nature of the soul reached its apex. It was at this time that the idea of metempsychosis was proposed by Pythagoras, describing a very similar premise to the concept of reincarnation, described in the Bon Tibetan Book of the Dead, adopted by contemporary and subsequent Buddhism. The myths of both the Tigris-Euphrates and Nile River Valley cultures evolved to combine stories involving multiple patron deities of their various city-state provinces. In Egypt, the Kemt Empire arose during the Old and Middle Kingdoms by uniting the cities of Thebes in southern Upper Egypt and Memphis in northern Lower Egypt, the Nile River anomalously for the northern hemisphere flowing from south to north. The cultures that had formed around Thebes, including the Aswan, Dendara, and Abydos city-states, and those formed around Memphis included the Saqqara, Giza, Cairo, Heliopolis, and Nile Delta region city-states. Likewise, the various disparate city-states along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers valley, called the Fertile Crescent region, each had their own unique system of beliefs about the natural forces or gods of their regional pantheon and each thus had its own patron deity that participated in the myths along with those of the other city-states. So, in each town was dedicated a temple to its patron deity, such that in the Mesopotamian Fertile Crescent region, the sun god Shamash was venerated in southern Larsa, Ur, Uruk, Bad Tabira, Shurupak, and Lagash, while the patron god of the northern city-states of Sippar, Kish, Larak, Nippur, and Babylon was the warrior god Marduk. Likewise, the beliefs in the pantheon of eight gods called the Ogdoad in Upper Kempt, Thebes to the south, and that in the concept of monotheism as the omni-deity, Atum Ptah, whom fertilized the sacred mound of Nui Chu in Lower Kempt, Memphis to the north, combined to form the extremely intricate metaphysical cosmology of the Empire of Kempt in Old and Middle Kingdom, Egypt. The Levant Mesopotamian and Egyptian regions exchanged first religious concepts of their metaphysical cosmology then fought extensive wars against one another as expanding empires, and finally exchanged migrating populations, before both were ultimately subsumed into the Ottoman Empire under the monotheist religion of Islam, in which condition, for the most part changed only by imposed political borders, they remain to this day. The Abrahamic monotheism of Islam is considered the continuation and culmination of the prior evolutions of the monotheist concept following its initial adoption by Abraham of Ur while migrating through the Sinai Peninsula into Egypt. From a period in time around 2000 to 1900 years ago, at the time of Jesus the supposed Messiah or World Savior, the conflict between the already increasingly monotheist Bedouin Arabic Semites of the Levant region against the Latinized Etruscans of the Roman Empire had apparently culminated with the final Caesar of Rome abdicating to the role of Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. By that time the various myths of the region were beginning to be combined into the single monomyth of monotheism and the previous regional pantheons of city-state patron deities were becoming religiously demonized beside the monotheist myth of Ahura Mazda and his son, the Messiah, Zoroaster. 
Because the cross-continental land-based migration routes penetrated into the southernmost reaches of South America most recently, some 7,000 years ago, the cultures of the American civilizations were those to evolve the most recently as well. They mimic, despite alleged lack of pre-Columbian transatlantic oceanic trade routes, the cultural development of civilizations that had occurred slightly sooner in the Indian, subcontinent of Asia, and Levant of Mesopotamia and Egypt. In South America, first nomadic tribes developed the use of land cultivation tools, such as plows, and the domestication of cereal grains and cattle occurred forming isolated urban metropoli that eventually became so massively populated they formed an interconnected network of cross-culturally population exchanging multiple city-state empires, which then culturally stagnated and eventually de-evolved into primarily blood-sacrifice religious, ritual-based empires contemporary to the rise of monotheistic Islam in the Levant and that of Buddhism in the Orient. Contemporary to the beginnings of the Neolithic Revolution in North America, and the beginnings there of the earliest semi-sedentary settlements following aeons of hunting the migratory indigenous bison herds, the South American continent was already, apparently, at a very highly advanced degree of civilization in terms of the complexity of their culture, religious rituals, and metaphysical cosmology. While the earliest Chaco Canyon Grand Lodge settlements and the Anasazi Pueblo hut-dwelling, cliff-faced dwellers of the modern Arizona and Nevada deserts developed their earliest sweat lodges or rudimentary astronomical observatories, alike Stonehenge in the much earlier developed region of the English European island, at the same time in South America, the Iken mummy-making culture engraved the enormous geoglyphs and lines on the stony desert surface of the Nazca Plain in modern Peru and settled the complex uphill water-channeling canal grid agriculture of the Altiplano in modern Brazil. By the time of the Spanish-European discovery of the American continents, by the fleets of Christopher Columbus for Catholic Ferdinand and Isabella in 1492, the high degree of technology and culture in the South American continent had largely already sunk into the rainforests, and the Mesoamerican cultures of the Aztec and Mixtec had become, as mentioned, renowned for their bloody ritual human sacrifice as part of their religion to a pantheon of natural forces and localized patron deities. In North America, the majority of the population remained largely nomadic until the final settlements in the Pacific Coast in modern California by European colonists as recently as the 1800s AD. Each nomadic tribe maintained its own inherent culture, and there was some degree of cross-cultural exchange commenced between them as evidenced in the similarities between the Mesoamerican Mayan and the North American Cherokee calendars. Although the Mayan culture expressed a high degree of technological and, particularly in astronomical observations, very advanced form of metaphysical sciences, the Cherokee of North America were a disparate connection of family-based nomadic tribes who migrated following the herds of wild buffalo. Another example of the naturalist shamanism of the North American 500 nations of tribal natives is the Hopi tribe, who ingested peyote as part of their religious ritual to their pantheon of natural force-based deities, called the Kachinas, and developed many prophecies in a simple harmonious oneness with the land. In the Vedic and later Hindu pantheistic myths and metaphysical cosmology of the Indian subcontinent of Asia, they attest to the two basic systems of base 7 and base 12 in the form of the seven chakras, spinal ganglia and plexi, and the twelve chi meridians, 
nerve fibers extending throughout the body. During the Hellenistic era, rise of monotheism in the Levant 2,000 years ago, they testified to Gnostic Archonism, asserting the role of seven archangels guarding over twelve aeonic archons, or fallen angels. Even in the Mesoamerican Mayan pantheon described in their mythic record the Popol Vuh, there are seven Zebalba Bay, or houses of the underworld, and there are twelve Zebalba, or lords of the underworld. All of this is, of course, no coincidence, and is due, logically, although apparently counterintuitively, to transoceanic trade via seafaring natural rafts, such as the Contiki yacht of thatched river reeds, made and successfully sailed by anthropologist Thor Heyerdahl. There is evidence to indicate there were settlements of proto-hominids in the southernmost tip of South America, even earlier than 7000 BC, and this intuitively seems to substantiate the concept of migrations of populations occurring in staggered sequences, such as in varied stages like waves, literally, in this case, by traveling in boats along the coastlines of the continents ahead of their landlocked fellow migrating nomadic tribes people. That all these cultures shared these basic number sum sets of various different traits in their metaphysical cosmologies and myths of natural force-based deities is essentially an Eastern Oriental originating Western migrating trend over the durations of the millennia chronologically can also not be denied and seems to serve as proof for however seemingly implausible to us now as we enter the 21st century AD a forgotten transcontinental seafaring, global civilization that existed prior to the oldest records of existing Homo sapien civilizations known of today, and populated by a people who inspired the concepts of considering the natural forces as gods or demi-deities that lasted contemporary to the later cohabitation of our species' earliest ancestors with the Neanderthal species, some twelve to 10,000 years ago, until the construction of the earliest antediluvian city-states along river valleys in India, the Levant, and Africa, some six to 5,000 years ago. It should not be overlooked that, just as they are described in the already by then ancient myths of these earliest civilizations of the Vedic, the Sumero-Babylonian, and the Egyptian Kempt empires, the heroes or demigods of this time period devoted great deals of their lifetimes to the study of the nature of the concept of the soul. The consensus apparently reached, thus, already by the time the earliest city-states of our modern era of human history were built, was that the nature of the soul was like a mere reflection of the nature of the biological body within which it inhabited itself, and that each biological body reflected certain aspects of the cosmos. For example, our species' anatomical trait of having seven central nerve plexi and ganglia, five along the spine and two inside the cranium of the skull, coupled to twelve basic nerve fibers, that extend from these throughout the rest of the tissues of the typical Homo sapien physical form. By having this basic base 7 over base 12 system within, we are autonomically attracted to find other patterns alike and similar to it. This has proven to be the quest to substantiate the concept of the soul. We have, as a species throughout our history, found many similar patterns to our own interior biological patterns in the surrounding nature of our planetary ecosphere and in the conceptual cosmos we conceive of as surrounding Earth. By comparing these seemingly alike patterns to one another, we can examine their natural similarities and differences 
and come to conclusions based on these data sets as to the basic essential nature of our shared collective reality. To begin with the nature of our species, as a fetus develops in the womb, it passes through phases of its cellular developmental process that are essentially identical in their protozoic nature to the larval gestative cycles of most other genuses, families, and species in the animal kingdom of our planet. We evolve our brains from cell clusters no larger than the brains of insects into those with the conscience of fish, into reptiles, and finally into mammals before being born as our own species. Thus, as we develop and mature perinatally, while still in utero inside the womb, we are simultaneously growing and developing the capacity for self-aware sentience in the form of the electromagnetic aura that infuses this cellular cluster to continue to evolve in its embryonic suspension that we later call the soul or spark of life. When the average human being, Homo sapien, is born, they have the basic pentagonal geometrical symmetries in their utmost extraneous appendages, as in their facial features and in the arrangement of their limbs around their torso. Likewise, we are born with seven orifices in our skull, a mouth, two ears, two eyes, and two nostrils, and five senses, tasting flavors, feeling touch, seeing sight, hearing sound, and smelling odors. Seven plus five equals twelve. Thus, because we have a base five biological pattern, we have a base seven central nervous system pattern and a base 12 peripheral nervous system pattern that combines the two. In total, the sum essence of the aura given off by our personal electromagnetic field surrounding our biological body measures a concentration density that can be either tightly packed into the inside of a very small scope of space and a rapid rate of repetition of cycles in time, or can be expanded to encompass a vast range of space-time and it can be transported at the whim of whoever's mind it is that would guide it. Thus the Atman of the aura is able to astral travel while leaving the body in a condition of apparent autonomic functionality and return to the living body at will. However, there are obviously many psychic rules and physical limitations for doing so. In Tantric Buddhist Yoga today, as in Tantric Vedic Yoga 6,000 years ago, the mind is induced into a meditative trance state called Satori in Vedic, or Nirvana in Hindi, or Samadhi in Buddhism, wherein the goal is to attain as little an amount of mental stimulation in the form of electrical activity interior to their central nervous systems as possible to calm the reactions to exterior stimuli and to relax the natural proclivity for response to them. This is meant to imitate the death state the body will one day be in, in order to practice for this event when it one day occurs. It is said, for example, that while meditating in this condition beneath a bodhi tree, the Buddha transcended existence, leaving no trace of his former physical form. Just so, in perceiving the cycles of the cosmos as they exist in reality, we must rely equally as heavily on our sensory perceptions as upon our conceptualization of the realm of a supernatural force into which our psyche evaporates at death. Although we may experience the perception of this seemingly parallel dimensional mental realm, albeit invisibly to our normal senses, we must depend equally as heavily upon our senses, our common sensibility, and, most importantly, upon that sixth sense, our own sentient self-awareness. In this sense, we may become aware that our mental sphere of perceptual influence is actually like a hypersphere, or one large sphere, 
surrounded by a layer of infinite smaller spheres, such as also the composition of our utmost cosmos when mapped according to the nature of our local continuum space-time dimensional fabric, that there is a local cosmos surrounded by a potentially trans-infinite number of smaller baby universes that bubble up inside black holes at the cores of galaxies. Because the mind's eye as a perceptual concept can be imagined as similar in the sense of resembling the toroid-shaped model of a fourth-dimensional hypersphere to the utmost outer extension of space-time in our material cosmos itself, we can assert their one-to-one -one ratio for capacity and comprehension to all knowledge of the nature of the entire cosmos itself.